68 to 70. And where where were you? I was with 26 Marines, uh, basically out of the Nang. So you saw a lot of heavy action. I saw no. Let's see, I was there 68, 69, and uh, two core areas in Central Highlands, working uh, from the South China Sea to the Cambodian border and all points in between for anybody that wanted us to work. We had a specialized type of job. Uh, it's called Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol. So a four-man team that goes out and stays anywhere from three to nine to 12 to 30 days in any given area to monitor enemy activity, set up ambushes, uh, hunter-killer teams, sniper detail, uh, selective assassinations, and the general destruction of the communist uh, infrastructure, political officers, etc. So you saw you saw action directly. Yeah. Every day, almost. Not we worked like. Well, when did you serve? In the army. Yeah. From uh, 1968 to 1971. The trauma I experienced was is that I uh, killed another GI. How? With a 38 pistol. I shot him. Over an argument? That's right. When were you in Vietnam? March 68 to March 69. So now you have nightmares? Sometimes. Did the, were they around before Vietnam at all? I don't think I had any more or less nightmares before Vietnam than any normal person does. Post-traumatic uh, nightmare is the usual word. It's just a nightmare after a traumatic event, which usually refers to the event. When I talk about post-traumatic nightmares, it's really the nightmare which occurs in a post-traumatic stress disorder. And that is really a clinical uh, diagnosis uh, which requires uh, four elements. And let me just mention them briefly. One, an overwhelming life stressor, such as being in a fire, being raped, uh, uh, being a, a survivor of the Holocaust, being in certain situations in Vietnam. Uh, secondly, there is a reoccurrence or uh, a uh, remembrance of the event which is fairly powerful. This is either flashbacks, reliving experiences in waking life, or dreaming about the event. That's one category. Second, there is an effect on interpersonal behavior such that there is either a muting of affect or a withdrawal from stimulating interpersonal uh, situations. And lastly, there are a series of sort of a, uh, a laundry list of symptoms in which one complains about difficulty, or may have complaints related to anxiety, difficulties with memory, uh, difficulties sleeping, uh, difficulties in certain uh, uh, avoidance behavior in regard to having the experience stirred up. I, I think you find that from the unconscious that you get a recurrent dream when you're not getting the message. I mean, not just it with the uh, veterans, but it just with anyone. When you get a dream, it's like the, the unconscious is saying, come on, you know, wake up, uh, pay attention to this. That there's something that, that Psyche wants, wants the conscious mind to know. Now you have nightmares. Is it, is it about that experience or? It, uh, it's about that experience and, and some of the experiences that came after that. How often have you had them since Vietnam? Right after Vietnam, I went through a, about a two-year spell where they were uh, fairly regular once or twice a week. Uh, they would uh, make me wake up in starts. I had night sweats. Uh, tore beds up pretty bad. Yeah, I have some uh, reoccurring nightmares. Tell us. Uh, well, the one Amy and I have been working on was uh, the other three guys in my team and myself are in the bottom of a ravine. There's not too much uh, in the way of cover. It's just small brush. Or you can hide, but you can't move. If they look right at you, you're history. And uh, we're laying down here, laying dog, as we call it. And uh, the Vietnamese are moving all around. We know they're up there. It's one of those things you feel. So you don't have to look up to see that they're there. You automatically know they are when the dream starts. And uh, this Kit Carson scout we had, uh, 
my dream, walks up to the edge of the ravine, looks down in there and sees me instantly, just points me out. Then the whole area just fills up with North Vietnamese all along the top of the ravine. And firefight starts because we all know we're going to die and it don't make any difference now, so take as many as we can. Uh, I watch all my friends get shot to pieces and then I, I myself get shot in the end. So you actually die in the dream? Yeah. It's one of the few that I've actually felt burn when the bullet hits you. Right after I got out of the service, nightmares were almost totally associated with these experiences in Vietnam. As time went on, uh, they became less. One was an incident where my unit uh, walked into a minefield, and uh, there's some question as to whether there was enemy fire coming from a tree line that was on the other side of the minefield. We lost a lot of people in a very short period of time. Uh, my platoon lost approximately half of its men. The uh, headquarters element of the company walked into the minefield and uh, were taken out in toto. So how often did this dream happen? It was fairly frequent for the first two years after I got out. There were a lot of unresolved issues, a lot of anger around it. So anger, what other issues? I bore a certain amount of guilt. When I killed that man, what was it, it locked me into a, a, a light bulb. A light bulb? Yeah. He stole your light bulb? No, I asked him to put a light bulb in a truck. He came to work an extra hell. It became an argument, which became a very long story, which went from an argument to a death. Uh, I'll kill you. To a threat with a machete, to a threat with other friends, to me going out on the bunker and getting a, a pistol of mine that I loaned out and taking it back and setting up to kill him. I understand you have nightmares. Yeah. Did they start uh, before Vietnam or afterwards? Afterwards. And is it usually about uh, incidents that happen there? One that comes back through all the time. The first time I, when I was first there, I was with an infantry unit. The first time I did shoot someone, he died. And you know, I stayed. Because it was like I really wasn't trying to do anything, you know, harm anybody at that point. I was just firing the air. We, we, we were receiving incoming, and I was just putting out some out, you know, putting some rounds out. And I was sweeping back and forth. And I went my sweep in, the guy ran out behind a tree to go someplace else. And I hit him about four times. And I was saying that, you know, that brought me to reality, like, you know, bullets really killed people. Yeah. How did you feel? Guilty? I you? felt guilty and really bad because I felt like it wasn't supposed to happen, you know, like that, you know. Then I accepted it, you know, everybody kind of patted me on my back, you know, we got you killed, family, you know, now you're one of us, you know, one of those things. You know, that's about it. Any other dreams? Yeah, we had, once I had to shoot a little girl because I thought she had a hand grenade in a little box and it turned out that she did and that kind of stuff in a long, long time. So recently I never really been able to talk about it that much. I wake up and like my mind is moving and I've become used to the movement. And uh, uh I feel chased sometimes, or I'm chasing. Chased by? I, I never know. And you're chasing? Somebody. It's always, that's in black and white. And if I catch them, I kill them. The same if way I'm you chasing killed the GI. With my hands. Right after Vietnam, I went through a, about a two year spell where they were fairly regular once or twice a week. Yep, you're right. Starts in night sweats. For years, I've slept in, in about three places in my home. And I wake up really wet, and then I have to get out of my bed. I pull the covers back and go downstairs and uh, sleep on the couch. And then uh, the couch uh, blanket becomes wet, and then I, I go up and back to my bed. 
before I had the, my children, I had the extra bedroom already set up for me. So I could move from, uh, you know, one place to the other. So I really, uh, periods of really fragmented sleep. Confused, so disoriented, sometimes I scream. Yeah, it's real hard to sleep with me because I <laughs> roll around all over the place. Uh, I have to wear earplugs to keep myself, or keep from waking myself up. Uh, the most common sequence is, which you can see in very young people, children, uh, adolescents, something awful happens, you know, say they go through a fire, an auto accident, or someone dies right next to them. Uh, they will then dream about that event. You, the most frequent thing is, it's, it just lasts a few weeks. They'll dream first about the actual traumatic event, then gradually their dreams will incorporate that traumatic event into other bits of their dreaming. And if all goes well, after a month or two, they're back to having more or less the dreams they had before. And, and I actually think that that's one place where the, the post-traumatic dream can tell us something about the functions of dreaming. You can kind of see the dream incorporating, engulfing, you know, eating up the traumatic event, connecting it with other things, playing with it, using it, connecting it, until finally it's, it's absorbed. Part of the reason that these nightmares have such power or are recurrent would be that they connect to early experiences. Say, if, for instance, uh, one of these veterans was raised in a family where, uh, one, where he had to be very good and well-behaved and split off that whole other negative side, he would, and he would have developed something, what one would call a false self, and his true self would have been hiding. And, and when that happens, there's enormous rage from the self in having to lead a dishonest, inauthentic life and of feeling helpless uh, and having to uh, adapt to those around him. Were there a lot of thou shalt nots, for instance? Thou shalt not kill, perhaps, you know, that would be in violation then if they had to go out and kill with a very deep moral authority. If there is some conflict between their, say, ego ideal uh, how they see themselves, how they want to see themselves, and it's at variance with their unconscious experience, then I, I think it would be helpful to get some sense of what that variance is about and of where there is a conflict with their values. And you can get a hold of that, I should think, by looking at their genetic histories, their family history, the, the experiences in their families. I was brought up as a uh, Roman Catholic went to church uh, every Sunday. I went to Catholic school. Uh, to, I think the Catholic religion helps to perpetuate uh, a guilt on people. Do you think your other dreams are related around guilt? A lot of them are. I'm a very guilt-ridden person. Yeah, it's like a, a transfer of guilt from one incident to something else. I like that. I messed something up. And like, you know, I have a, a couple bad dreams about it. It's like, you know, the whole thing's just playing over again. I've never quite let myself off the hook. So you hate yourself? Yeah, I don't like myself very well. I've done a lot to try to destroy myself. It's a tug of war. There's a part of me that wants to go. There's a part of me that wants to die. When the trauma was so severe, or the person for some reason cannot deal with it uh, adequately, with or without therapy, it just stays, then it eventually reaches this state which I, I compare to an abscess, an encapsulated area in the body. You know, it's painful, it's, it's always sore, it's there, you can't, you can't get rid of it. Uh, you can't treat it, your antibiotics don't get to it, it just kind of sits there, you know, festering like an encapsulated uh, abscess. It's got a wall around it. And now this is, in, in people who've had severe traumas in war, for some reason, as the Vietnam veterans, for some reason it hasn't become absorbed, it was too severe for them.
A nightmare is Psyche's most dramatic way of, of getting heard. And with a nightmare, you have a powerful combination of instinct or affect, feeling, and image. And it seems to be at that place that real healing seems to occur. So, so what are these nightmares attempting to accomplish? Well, uh, from a Jungian point of view, they would be trying to make the individual more conscious, to know more about himself, to get in touch with that shadow part that may have an enormous amount of energy and potential for, develop, for development, to be more whole. Do you think there's a part of yourself that's trying to become integrated through these dreams, become recognized? I don't know. I'm, I've just tried to keep them away. I'd rather not have them. That'd be the easiest way to say it. I just really wouldn't like to have them. Well, they're really scary. I've tried to get them to go away from them. I've tried to make them go away. I don't want them. Maybe. maybe they're trying to tell you something. Maybe they're actually something useful that they can help you. When I remember what I'm dreaming, it isn't really useful. It's um, scary. It puts me back. And, um, the dreams are terrifying and very disturbing when I have them, because they seem to uh, intensify all the other problems I have. And I guess this correlation of one adds to the other, and the other pulls back to the beginning, which goes back to the dream. And it seems like it's something that just won't let you go, it wants to keep you in the past. You know, people with post-traumatic nightmares, the encapsulated form, post-traumatic stress disorder, as you suggested, are very hard to treat. They're hard to treat in therapy because Anything, they, they jump, they scream, I mean, almost literally, you know, getting to the difficult event sometimes sets off a whole flashback experience. Uh, and they don't want to be reminded of it. They, part of their pathology, aside from the nightmares and flashbacks, is that they avoid emotion. They avoid anything that could remind them of the traumatic event. The traumatic uh, we don't have a clear view about effective treatment for either post-traumatic stress disorder or for uh, nightmare sufferers. Uh, many a different techniques have been applied, and in individual cases, you can get case reports of uh, the value of desensitization, the value of depth psychotherapy approaches of uh, various sorts, the value of medication. Uh, but there is no agreement based on the, uh, the published literature as to what uh, the most effective treatment is, or really, if you look at all of the literature, of an effective treatment. There have been many studies, and there's, there's no consensus on how to treat them. Every class of psychoactive drugs uh, has been reported as potentially useful, and in the same way, we then have anecdotal and studies which have pointed out that in a comparable groups, they have not been effective. So MAO inhibitors, these are antidepressant drugs, which are REM suppressant, have been reported as useful. Uh, we've had uh, other classes of antidepressants, the tricyclics reported as useful, the anti-anxiety agents, the benzodiazepines, and again, as I said, uh, they've also been reported as not useful in similar groups. I have taken some for my uh, adrenaline stop, but I think it's called propanitol. I've had the opportunity to use that. They've given me permission to ask for it. So I've, I've used it three times since I've been here. I get really, really intense headaches. And uh, it, uh, it's because of this stress and tension. And it seems that the propanitol, well, uh, it really lets the headache go away. Yeah. Uh, I see buspar, lithium, and uh, nartriptyline. Yeah, I get really, I used to get severely depressed. The lithium they use to curb my violent tendencies. So that's the only way I know how to deal with things that upset me is just get violent. And yeah. It used to work before. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't anymore. How long are you up there? Not real certain. It's weeks, three weeks. Uh, not like here. No. I That's... started telling them that they wanted to hear so that I could get off the Thorazine. When I got off the Thorazine, the nightmares came back. That stuff is so ugly. It takes away you. It 
takes away everything that is. It takes away the, the soul, the inner person. It, it's a horrible drug. God help people that have been on it for years. Being involved with others in some sort of group situation seems to at least take the edge off the response. People have used group therapy. It's sometimes useful at least to know that they're not alone, that a lot of other people have the same thing. So from a, from a therapeutic standpoint, how could you help them to integrate this split off part? I, I think primarily to be able to see their rage imaginally, to have a sense of it, and to make room in the therapeutic or analytic container for the expression of that. It might come out really very raw. Do you think they're, they're trying to help you, these dreams? I would say, yeah. At least in terms of, like, in the dream class, being able to go through and, and uh, you know, look at them and, and interpret some of the symbolic meanings, and, and I've gotten some answers out of that. So they're not just something you want to block out? Oh, no, I definitely think they ought to be used. Psychodrama. And why? Because with that, you're able to uh, play all the roles, and you can see what is real in the dream, what isn't. And then it answers a lot of questions that, you know, you can't answer when you're just looking at the dream. Yeah. Are you painting the pictures? There's a lot of aspects of a dream that are mysterious. And if you don't have the right coordinations, you can't answer it. And in psychodrama, you're able to act it out and see things. And things come up that would tell you, you know, what the dream was really about or how it correlates with you. Yeah. Uh, but then it's up to you to use as much of it as possible.